God 2015. Yay! Yay! This is our first service that you all are seeing this 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 for 2015. God is doing some great things in our lives. For all of y'all out there who do not know, we are about to get ready and launch a web a website. It will be uh, it's not it's not it's not published yet. Still working on some kinks on it. Uh, we got to uh, create a couple other things uh, to install into the web page. Been working on it diligently for about a week and a half, two weeks now. But look for it. It'll be posted on Facebook and uh, Google and all the cool stuff, and it'll become. As we we try to try to go worldwide, man. Try to go worldwide. Thank you all, all of you all from the different countries who are liking us on Facebook, uh, Uganda, uh, China, uh, Japan, uh, Jamaica, Africa, and uh, Germany. Uh, I even had somebody from uh, Russia. Uh, they they sent them sent the message on now. And uh, it's a whole bunch of folk, folk out there from Haiti. And I, I just, I, I just thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you all who are watching us. God is so awesome, so awesome. When I get messages coming from different people and that they're different liking us and they're asking different questions, just take the back of my card. I'm gonna hold my card right here. <laughs> Praise be to God. But all glory be to God. And it's going to be even better in 2015. God is so, so cool, so, so awesome. I love you all. But let's go right on into the Word of God. Let's go right to the Father first. Father God, we come in right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father God, for your love, your compassion. There is no other God but you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for this upcoming year. And as we go into this year, you are breaking the bondages and loosening, uh, taking away the yokes and destroying every yoke that can hurt, hurt and burden your people. We thank you, Father God. We love you for your strong arm. No other God but you. Thank you, thank you, that can't thank you enough. And we thank you now beforehand, Father God, as we see those things come to pass in our lives, loved ones being saved, loved ones being filled with the Holy Spirit, loved ones having addictions broken in their lives, and more and more people committing themselves to you than ever before, Father God. We thank you, we love you, and we appreciate you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now I submit myself to you, Father, God, spirit, soul, and body. Use my mind, use my heart, use my mouthpiece to minister your word to your people this day. And we covenant with you right now, Father God, to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all of the glory forever and ever. <clears throat> in Jesus' name, amen, amen for every victory that will come out of today's session. Amen, amen, and amen, and a to the man. Isaiah. We've already started in the book of Isaiah. No, thank you, Holy Spirit. Change the plans. You, you're already there in Isaiah. Cause we, we, we've already been here. Some of y'all know that. We've already been here. I want you to go over to the book of Ecclesiastes. It's one book over. <laughs> you're there in the book. You're in Isaiah. Go back. Go back one book. And for some of you all, you have your tablets and stuff. Some of you all, you have your tablets and stuff. You know, you know, you probably get the little thing on your tablet. And you just do 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 I used to be able to, I used to confess these things by faith, but now I can actually physically begin to see it, that God, because I remember the first time I heard my pastor talk on, teach on this, I my pastor teach on it, and I heard him say it, and I want, because I wanted to be like him so bad, so bad. Yeah. <laughs> Everything he say, I used to want to just see it. Now here it is, ten years later, 
since the time I heard him say it. I actually can see it in my life now. When you can start to see the doorway begin to open to the next level of your life. And I, I can actually begin to see this doorway open. Bible talks about when, when, when God opens up. It, the Bible doesn't talk about it, but it, it should it, it should be in the Bible. <laughs> and people make a statement when God opens one door, when He closes one door, He opens up another. <laughs> That's not in the Bible. It's really really not. But it should be. But it's not in there. God would put it in there. But you can see how God does start to open different doors. And when he opens those doors, you don't necessarily know what's on the other side of the door. I like to make reference to it as it's like salvation. When you first get born again, you come into the front door of a brand new house. But if you stay just right there at the front door in the foyer, you never know what's going on in the kitchen. You never know what's going on in the bathroom. You never know what's going on in the other bedrooms. You might not even know how many other bedrooms in the house. You definitely won't know what's going on in the attic. And if you stay just at the front door, if you stay just at the front door, you won't know what's going on in the backyard. Remember how Jesus made a statement? He said, my people will be able to come in and out and find pasture. I can see that now. He's referring to the house. He's, refer he's referring to a house to a degree. Now, you might have got a different revelation on it, but think about it. When you in the when you in the kingdom of God, you can go in and out of a house. You go to the front yard, you go to the street. Then you eventually you won't come back in the house. You go in the backyard. You go down to, to the edge of the backyard to where it's fenced all off. And, and maybe to somebody else's yard. But eventually you won't come back into the house. You better go in and out. And I, I'm starting to really, really see this door open, uh, and that's what our, that's what our vision is. Our vision is based on the, a timing. Ecclesiastes chapter three. Look what it says in verse one. We're not going to read all of these, but just this is going to hit a few of these right here. To everything, verse one. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. <clears throat> I want you to drop down. We're not going to read all of these. I want you to look at verse 9. It says, What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. And he hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in, his, in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Glory to God. That resonates with me just so strongly. Key verse here. Verse 9, what profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? He's asking almost like a rhetorical question. He's saying, tell me the truth. And all the stuff that you do and that you work, what profit do you really have in it? It's 
See, some of y'all hearing it and you're not hearing it. You think, well, I went to work, I got paid. Look at Bill Gates, he worked, and he's a multi, multi billionaire. Look at Donald Trump. Look at Oprah Winfrey. They work. Yeah, there is a hard work. But hey, question, question. Thank you very much for that. Is it an everlasting profit? It's not. Jesus said it best himself. He said, what profit is it that a man gains the whole world then lose his soul? No. <clears throat> Even after all, it's a time to kill, time to give life, time to plant, time to pluck up, and then everything that's under this heaven, there is a time to do it. There's a time to get up and go to work. There's a time to brush your teeth. There's a time not to brush your teeth. You can't even brush your teeth while you're eating chicken at the same time. I mean, I'm, I'm just <laughs> cracking a joke here, but think about it. You just can't do it. You, you can't do it. It doesn't does work that way. There's a time to sit down and create a business plan. There's a sit down, sit down and create a budget. There's a time to go to work. There's a time to clock out. There's a time to take a break. There's a time to play with your little gadgets. When you're on the clock and working, it ain't time to be on your phone. You are, you working? Why you got your phone in your hand? It's not it's not that time. Okay, so after you get to doing all that, what profit do you have? After all the money you didn't spend on <laughs> this and toys and gadgets and games and this and that, what profit do you really have? Look what it says here. That's not, no, I said it's a rhetorical question. Look what it says, verse 10. He says, I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He said, I have seen all of the different things that people are, are doing that God gave men. Let me, let me read. Let me read it like this. Let me, let me read it like this. Oh no! Where's it? Where's it? Where's it? He says, "I'm gonna read it to you like this." Verse nine, and read it in uh, or, or the, the New American Standard Version. He says, "What profit is there to the worker?" from that in which he toils. I have seen the task which God has given to the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. He said, I've seen it. How many of you all have actually stepped back and looked at all the different jobs or careers <coughs> or things that people supposed to be doing? As much as people criticize Barack Obama, I love the President of the United States. He's our President. I pray for him. Not as, probably not as much as I should, but I have prayed for him. He's made some really, really tough decisions. But all of the double H-E hockey sticks that this country is going through, he didn't do all of it. What about the hundred and uh, 200 years before he got in the office? What about, forget 20 years ago, what about eight years ago when the, when, when the Bushes were in office? Okay, so, no, 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 make statements. I just want y'all, I'm trying to draw a point here. I want you to see that. Y'all, you getting out of eight days, some terrible thing. Don't do that. I want you to think. The point is this. He said, he said I've taken a step back and really, really look at the job that they got at hand. And us as people, we always find in ways. They should have did that. They want blood. Kill them. No. Get, impeach them. Get them out. No. Fire them off the job. We, we try to step back, and we won't take a step back and look and say, they got a really, really tough job in hand. Mm -hmm. Now, people need to be held accountable. Don't get me wrong. Please hear me very carefully. People need to be held accountable. But what would you do if you was in that job? 
He said, I've seen it. Here's the part that I really, really want to get. Verse 11 says, He, which is God, has made everything appropriated in its time. He also set eternity in their heart. Yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. The only way you'll be able to know how it's all going to play together <clears throat> is if God starts revealing it to you. Really, and, and you, when you do that, you start seeing yourself not being so judgmental. I want you to really catch this. We're talking about commitment. We're talking about commitment. What if, please hear me carefully, what if you had an opportunity to take a million dollars, you had somebody gave you a million dollars, what would you do with that million? See, most people on the front end buy me a house, buy me a car, okay, then what? Mm -hmm. Pay off my bills, then what? If you got a million dollars worth of bills, I mean, yeah, it, it's, 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 what, 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 what else can you do with it? I want you, thank you very much. It's going out. You find ways to create businesses. You find ways to create something that's going to benefit somebody. And that's going to be lasting. That's going to be lasting. God, he's no, we just, we just read it. He said, he said, he says, he has made everything appropriate in his time. He has also set eternity in their heart. God has will reveal different things to you in your heart. That doorway will begin to open and you'll be able to see it. And you'll be like, okay, Lord, I can, we, we can do that. If I can find two or three scriptures, we can get it done by faith. If I can, if I see the scripture, no, by faith we can get this thing done. We can get it done. That's when God will start to be able to begin to add things to your life. Why? Because your commitment to Him, because He's already committed to you. There's a time for it. There's a time for it. You can't drive more than one car at a time. You can't play with more than one game at a time. <clears throat> and not give your full attention to it. You can't you can only do one job at think about it. why do you think Jesus had to leave? Otherwise Jesus would have stayed. He was limited in what he could do. He was, he was a physical man. Spiritual man, spirit in the, he born against, he had a spirit on the spirit of God on the side of him, but he was limited. That's why they had to wake him up when he was in the back of the ship. Jesus, don't you care that we pass? What? Aren't you sitting there asleep? You were tired, physically tired. But he says, I'll send to you unto you the comfort. I'll send the comfort unto you. You'll know that I've gone, be back, sat down with the right hand of the Father by the Holy Spirit coming to, coming to you. Now the Holy Spirit, he's not limited. He's everywhere at all times. Notice what it says. Moving on to the next verse. He says, uh, verse 12. I know that there is no good in them but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. He's referring to his not generated spirit yet. At this time, they didn't have all this. Solomon never had a chance to live in this earth with the spirit of God 
in him. You do though. He never had a chance to walk this life with the Spirit of God. King David never had a chance. Moses, as great as they were, they never had a chance to walk this earth and live this life with God on the inside of them. But you do though, every day. And he's saying, you know, what is, we just read that again? He said, I know that there is no good in them. I know there ain't no good in people. People, people, people are wicked. People are unrighteous. And people are not committed to nothing. He says, but, what did he say? Almost sound like he canceled out. He said, but for man to rejoice and to do good in his life, to do good, to do good. And everything that they did was based on works. Don't get into this philosophy that every single thing that you do is not based on your works. Got to qualify that. <laughs> I just can't come out and say that. Just, we are saved by grace. It ain't based on your works on the front end. It's based on the works that God did. Only thing God asks you to do is receive Jesus Christ, your Lord, receive the Spirit of God on you by being baptized through the Holy Spirit, and then start renewing your mind, and then God will infuse you from through renewing of your mind from your born again spirit. Instead of being led by your mind, you'll be led by your spirit. Your spirit man gonna tell your mind what to do, and then your mind gonna tell your body what to do, and then you just put forth your best effort to get it done. I just wrapped up spirit, soul, and body like that quickly. Remember, before you got born again, all you did was operate by your mind. You did what your mind told you to do, and our minds had been taught by everything under the sun. We have been TV, movie, and some of us prior before TVs and movies, we was radioed, we was Uncle Ray Ray and Aunt Cousin and Aunt Susie and everybody else. We had been all that stuff so much and, and generation after generation after tradition after tradition was passed down and then all of a sudden we started letting everybody else tell us a vision right and then we never went back to get the real vision from god and now we just we know when you go when you get married oh, ain't no wrong. You, you, who says that marriage is supposed to last forever nobody really knows that it's going to last forever you commit yourself to god it will <laughs> See, y'all play this game with me. And you can't play this game. You can't, you cannot fool God. You can't do it. God knows when you were sitting in front of the computer and he knew when you was looking at that woman. That ain't your wife. He knew that. Scrolling through Facebook, looking through Facebook saying, I wonder who I can befriend, just start talking to. My wife knows my password. She on my Facebook account at any time. What well, they need all that for? Ain't about privacy? You ain't privacy when you married? <laughs> so that's why he said, ain't no good thing in man, but you gotta choose to rejoice and do good in, this, in, 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 in his life. Just gotta choose. It's a choice. It's, everything is based on a choice. Choose to be committed or choose not to be committed. Choose to be committed, choose not to be committed. Now all like I said, it's sound. So I like God, I kind of like got the whooping going on here, but everything has a season under the sun. Everything. Everything, everything, everything. Now the question is, what have you chosen under the sun that you, under the heaven that you under? What have you chosen? Watch this. Do the wrong. Do to the wrong no me. Really? I have a question for you. In a second. Yes, ma'am. Hold it, hold it down. Okay. I will let you ask it. Deuteronomy. That's our Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The fifth book of the Bible. The fifth book of the Bible. I want you all to see this. 
Deuteronomy. Now I'm over here in the Old Testament. I thought we led under grace. We do. <laughs> we do. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Okay. Y'all there? Yep. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Let's look at verse 19. Look what it says. Here's God right now. See, a lot of people, this is where a lot of people miss it when it comes to grace. Even though Jesus paid the sin price for us, he died and rose from the dead. But only thing Jesus did when he took the sin debt at a specific time, because we still talking about time. When he, when he died on a specific day at a specific time, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. At that time, God had to count everybody under bondage. He says, okay, the only way this is going to be able to work is if I qualify everybody under bondage. Even the people who were not even born yet. So I'm going to classify all of them under bondage and I'm going to go destroy the yoke. Because if they get born, when they're born into the world, that yoke is eventually going to get on them because of what Adam did. Remember, Adam was a representation for all mankind. That yoke is going to get on them. So the only way it's going to, I'm going to be able to help them out, who the people ain't even born, plus help them out, that's if I die for everybody. So when I die for everybody at this specific time, it's going to break the yoke of them as well as everybody else. What's that going to happen? When I break this yoke and Jesus Christ rise from the dead, only thing happened at that time, it didn't make you saved. It just gave you back the choice to choose, the option to choose. I know y'all see that. It gave you back that option. It gave you back the option to choose. See, beforehand, you didn't have that option. Adam stole that from you. He stole the choice from you because of what he did. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, qualify, believes in him should not perish. He's put the option back into your hand to be able to choose him or not choose him. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Here's God. I call heaven and earth to record this day against who? Everybody say me. Me. That I have set, which is God have set, before you life and death, blessing and and cursing, therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Notice how he says choose life. Just in case if you are not quick enough to grab hold to what life is, look what he says. Verse 20 says what, what, the, what it is. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. God says, the same promises that I have established in Jesus, it was established Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob before you ever even came. Adam screwed it up. God
God saw this big mess from Adam all the way to Abram. He tried to work some things out with Noah. It didn't really all, it didn't clear all up. And then he tried to work this way, uh, that thing out with Nimrod. Well, actually, it was, it was uh, Adam and then there's Nimrod. And Nimrod screwed some stuff up. That's where the Tower of Babel and stuff came, eventually came in. And then God said, okay, well, let me clean some things up again. And he tried to work it out with Noah. And then I got all messed up again. And then God said, okay, this thing ain't working anymore. And then he got over to Abraham. He said, okay, I see this big mess. Let me correct it. Abram, if you believe me, I'm going to take care of you. He came in. He started operating by faith before the law even came into play. God, notice how we're still talking about timing. All these different times up under the heaven, God see this, this big giant mess. And God says, okay, I got to correct this somewhere. See, God does talk about minding your own business. There's a small window somewhere in, in, in our life where you are supposed to mind your own business. If people want to eat collard greens all the time, fine, let them eat collard greens. If you want to eat beets, go right on here. You can beat yourself to content. I'm not touching them. I'm not touching them. But, as, as, but there comes a time where you have to intervene in some people's lives somewhere. When I say intervene, you have to somewhere. Because if you don't, they'll end up killing themselves. Think about what if God would have just said, oh, Adam screwed up, that's his business. I'm going to let him mind his own business. And let him, and Adam would have been like, oh, y'all ate the fruit off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, let me go eat the fruit off this tree of life, too. Right. If he would, the Bible says, if he would have went and ate the tree oh, and off that fruit, he would have stayed in that fallen state of yeah. ever. So what if God would have minded his own business? So obviously there is a level in there where we have to intervene somewhere. There's a level. I can't pinpoint specific times. I can't. I cannot for you. I know that there are specific times in me that I had to pinpoint. I, you know, God, I have to intervene somewhere. You have, you have to. And God, because God says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, Choose life. Choose. And only you can do that. I can't do it for you. I cannot for you. For you. I can't have to choose it. I cannot choose it for you. I said for you. <laughs> Praise be to God. Uh, so now you know that God is your life. He is your source. He is your source. God is your source. God is your source. Last verse. You still got that question. Hold it, because we're going to just do it at the end. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Romans. Chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. We're still talking about timing. We're still talking about timing. Timing, timing, timing. It's up under the main topic of commitment. There's a specific timing. If you do not somewhere make the choice to choose Jesus Christ, if you do not make the choice to choose Jesus Christ, even after I mean, because he's already done it, even out of the way, since he's already paid the price, sin debt for you. If you don't make the choice to choose Jesus Christ, there's no hope for you. You'll live, you'll live in this earth, and then you'll physically die, and then you'll go straight to hell. You see, and a lot of people don't want to swallow that. Because they still they try to get off into the business of uh, you know, 
Well, they did this wrong. Well, they did that wrong. Well, what about this? And they try to classify sin. No, we just established that Jesus paid at a specific time, paid the sin debt with his life. He paid that debt. He, he came, he lived, he took the weight of sin on him, and when he died, the Bible talks about how he uh, took care of sin and he left it in the pit of hell. Look what it says. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Look how it says, uh, Oh Lord Jesus, was I writing in tongues? No, I was not writing in tongues. Here you go. Look what it says. <laughs> Verse 13. Verse 13. Verse 13. Verse 13 says, Verse 4, verse 13 says, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. I want you all to catch that. It said, for the promise that he should be the heir, H-E-I-R. Don't think heir is wind blowing. <laughs> heir. It means the head or the, or the one who is going to receive the promise. Notice it says, he should be the heir was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. God did not start the promises of uh, you choosing. It's not through some kind of law. That you go do, you got to do right. You got to do right. You got to do right. No, it wasn't just that. He said it wasn't through the law, but it was what? Through what? The righteousness of faith. Everybody agree that to me and say, God, God lived, lived and lives and by, faith. by faith. Watch this, what it says. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. He says, if you don't think you're going to get this thing done just by through some kind of law, and you just be obedient to the law, the law helps. Don't get me wrong. I want you to really, really think about it. We use laws right now in our everyday society. Think about how many people, the law says that when a yellow light comes on, you're supposed to start slowing down, and then you come to a stop, right? When it turns red. But what does people in their mindset do? They speed up. They try to get through the yellow light before it hits red. But the law says, you see a yellow light, you start slowing down. Then it will flip over to green. Now, some states, they need to readjust in some states, some cities, they're like, Green or red? Be like, three seconds, he's not. I'm doing 45 miles an hour. How can I stop in three seconds? <laughs> they need to readjust the timing on it. <laughs> but <laughs> the law says people are still doing what, though? They're breaking the law. It's the, no matter how much you try to do something just based on a law, you're going to eventually break it. Because the more and more you try not to do it, you're going to end up doing it. You end up doing it. Then he says, that's why it said it's not based on the law. It's based on faith. Because if it was based on the law, then faith would be what? Made what? Boy. And then the promise that God promised you won't even work. What promise? The thing that he's showing you as the doorway open up and you begin to see it, you're like, Okay. Well, maybe if I just I take a step back and I'm going to start trying to do something by law, then I'll get it. No, 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 no. Because if you're going to do that, you won't get it. Oh, Lord Jesus. I ain't never saw that before to just now. Here you go. Because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. No how he said, for the law worketh what? Wrath. Why did he say working wrath? Wrath is what? Uh, 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 it's a manifested anger. 
when you somebody's so mad, boom! That's just the wrath on the inside of you because you're trying to break through and you can't break through through that anger just by hitting. He says the law, the law works with wrath. No matter what you do to try to just, I got to perfectly obey this law. And if you try to perfectly obey a law, you're going to miss it. But through faith, you'll be able to obey the law. Oh, Lord Jesus, I'm going to say it again. If you just try to, on your own, you're supposed to put forth your best effort. But if you try to just do something through a law, you'll do it. But in the morning, you're going to mess up. Because you'll try to repeat what you do, just to obey the law. But if you do it through faith, no, Father God, I believe that we can get this thing done. You'll walk right on into it. So now it constitutes us believing and finding out at a specific time of what faith is and what this law. And faith is more than just believing. You have to, just like some of you all right now, you all sitting in this chair, your, your chairs right now, right? Do you, I don't see any one of you all struggling to sit in your chair, do you? Are you? You're not struggling to sit in the chair? You are totally persuaded that that chair you sitting in is going to support you. Right? Drop down. Drop down to verse 19. Look at verse 19. We're almost through. I said last year I got four minutes. And be not weak in faith. This is talking about Abram. Consider not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore, it is imputed to him for righteousness. So now all within this timing, you said, I am fully persuaded. I'm choosing to believe what God said is going to come to pass. So now it brings the forth of now you must be obedient in what? Being obedient to what the scripture says. If you put forth your best effort and being obedient to what the word of God says, don't just look at not cussing, not drinking, not smoking, not lying, not backbiting. Yeah, you fully, once you get full, some of y'all ain't fully persuaded in not committing adultery because you're still out there doing it. Some of y'all ain't fully persuaded by not lying because you're still out there doing it. You be fully persuaded, God, I am fully persuaded that if I obey this scripture, you're going to bring it to pass in my life. That's faith. You confess it out your mouth, and then your actions is just like you sit in that chair. You sit down in the scripture, and you say, God, you told me to give. Now, what a harvest. It's coming. I know it's coming. Oh, my father, I'm sorry. It's not is coming. It's here. Why is it here? I've already received it. I believe I received, and I have it. And when it shows up, I just start using it. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Praise God. And all this is within time. And it all is connected to what? Your commitment. Now for the rest of the now I, I want you to see, we talk a lot today about your commitment. When we started out as in how God opens the door. But for the upcoming weeks, we're going to see how God is committed to us. Oh my goodness. God is so committed to us that he won't bring it to pass. Did we, did, did we just read that? He is fully persuaded. He was fully persuaded that what he, what God promised God is able to perform it. Not what you're able to perform. What God is able to perform. God is committed.
committed to you. He's committed. He's committed. He's committed. He's committed. He's so committed that even when you make a mistake, he'll forgive you and treat you as if that had never even happened and keep you on. But it's connected to your commitment because you have chosen Jesus. Because you've chosen Jesus. You said, Jesus, okay, I believe you, Lord. I believe you, Lord. I believe you, Lord. It's, it's going to happen. So it's going to happen. Yeah, I believe you. And you just walk this life. And you go, you go treat people right and live and you pay your tithes and give your offerings. And, you know, you let, you, a lot of times you just let God worry about the details. Don't try to put God in the box. You just let God work out the details. Okay, Lord. And then God will begin to start showing you the doorway. And you'll see it. And don't get scared. You just walk through it. You say, okay, Lord, what's the next step? And he'll tell you what the next step is. And when you do the next step, you just, your, your whole thing is being prepared. So you just be prepared for anything. I didn't say that. <laughs> didn't say that. You just be prepared for when God, when God you'll begin, you'll see it. You'll see it. Question. Question I had is, does God Christ give you sometimes um, a mistake to make to show you a path? No, God don't give you a mistake no, to make. I don't mean that. I mean, you make a mistake, but he uses that mistake. Well, yeah, God will help God, and yeah, even in your mistakes. Because, see, it's one thing to step out there and start doing stuff. Because you believe that you have heard from God. Praise be to God. It's another thing to step out there presumptuously. Some people, they say, they say, okay, pastor, how do you know that you're called of God? Well, I just know. So you're talking about a feeling. No, it's not a feeling. I just know. So what? To tell me what happened. Well, one day, this such, 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 and this such, 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 and I just knew. So you're still connected to a feeling, so it's not, not a feeling. When I stepped out there and started doing certain things, did I make mistakes? Yes. God may teach you within the mistake. He don't give you the mistake. He, he don't say, go out there and make a mistake, but he'll teach you. Just, why? Because we're not perfect. When you start doing it, you'll begin to see it. Like when I first started years ago, when I first decided, I just knew that I was going to hell. I just knew I was. <laughs> and I, I'd say I, I can't keep going on this road but God did not let me die the 8, 10 years previously before mm -hmm. it's not about the mistake I just say okay Lord it's not a feeling I, you just step out there and you start doing it and then while you're doing it it's almost like a baby when a baby begins to walk he gonna fall he or she gonna fall down mm -hmm. and you don't say Boy, sit down somewhere. You ain't walking right. Don't walk no more ever again. Uh, uh, okay, no. On the job, when you're training people to do something on the job, they're going to make a mistake. But as they do it more and more and more, they get comfortable with it. And then just, and before you know it, they're just doing the job real well. So the mistake, it's not that God gives you the mistake. Right. I didn't mean it. I well, just I kind of figured, how to explain uh, it. Right. Kind of, kind of explain it. But you're going to make a mistake. You just step out there. And then uh, that's where other people will intervene within that timing. You might know a bit, no. They'll say, okay, this is where your mistake was. Just correct it. Yes. And, and it becomes that easy. Mm -hmm. But it's all within. If you're fully persuaded, that's a very good question. Very, very good question. If you're fully persuaded, 10 years from now, it won't even matter because you're still going to be doing it. People thought it was a joke that I would step out there and start teaching the word of God. Mm -hmm. Some people within my own family, and they just thought he he, he just playing games, you know. Mm -hmm. And some people still think I'm just playing games because we in this little bitty old room. And no, I just know God called me. I know I, I can see the door. I can see the doors. Mm -hmm. But you have to allow God to reveal it to you. Do y'all have some of the same questions out there? Hey, don't hesitate to ask the question, man. Well, uh, email me, write it down. But last, last here, here we go. We got one, one minute. I 
keep myself on the timer. Take the time. Take the time to go find out exactly how committed are you. We're going to get into some really, really cool things about how God is committed to us. And it should prompt you. I believe it's going to prompt you to want to become more committed to Him. Because the more and more you, the more and more, you can't outgive God. And you can't outcommit God. He's already given you His Son. Hmm. That's, that, that was heaven's best. Hmm. So you can't outgive God. It even says, if He's given us His Son, will He not freely give us all things? Well, praise be to God. Hey, God loves you. I love you. Remember, continue to learn how to follow Jesus Christ faithfully, holy, and holy. God bless y'all. I'll see y'all next time.